evening. On behalf of the Free Library of Philadelphia and the Social Science and History Department, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's program. Without further ado, let me introduce you to this evening's host. Craig Green is Professor of Law at Temple, University, uh, Temple University's Beasley School of Law. He has taught and written in the fields of administrative law, American legal history, civil procedure, constitutional law, and federal courts. He has also taught in the field of reproductive rights. Other teaching interests include conflicts of law, remedies, civil procedure, complex civil litigation, civil and political rights, First Amendment, separation of powers, legislation, federalism, constitutional history, history of American just judging and sentencing. In 2009 and 2015, uh, Professor Gre uh, Green received Temple Law School's George P. Williams Award as Outstanding Professor of the Year. And in 2010, he received Temple University's Lindback Award for Distinguished Teaching. Without further ado, okay. Thanks very much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, certainly, it's an honor and a privilege to be here in this sort of uh, cybernetic idea of where here really is. So uh, if folks can let me know, obviously, if the technology works, uh, it doesn't work, I suppose that's the way to say it, uh, that would be great. Um, last week, uh, I met a family friend from Georgia whose 17 and a half year old daughter was feeling anxious because she had sent off her very first voter registration and she hadn't heard back yet. Now, I was a little surprised and wanted to ask her uh, what got her so excited about voting and maybe did all of her other nerdy classmates feel like that, you know, some cadre of TikTok voters. Uh, and I wondered even more because she said that in her state, actually, there isn't even very much to vote for this year. Now, at that time, I didn't ask follow-up questions or launch some big discussion about voting rights. Uh, but indeed, uh, that is kind of what I'm up to this evening. And you folks are also here because you're interested and you care about voting. And I'm grateful for this chance to discuss with you uh, how voting emerged historically and also maybe what might be at stake in the future. Uh, to set the stage, voting is just one way to control governmental power. There are other ways, including protests or petitions or uh, media campaigns. And I want to contrast, uh, although they're linked, I want to contrast governmental power, which voting influences. I want to contrast that with non-governmental power, like business or private property, that are more directly influenced through buying and selling and wealth. The practice of voting is affected by the government's size and scope, and I'm mostly this evening going to focus on the federal government, which since the beginning has controlled things like war, taxes, diplomacy, and federal territories. Over time, the federal government has also influenced uh, canals, railroads, airlines, and the internet, and nowadays, as everyone knows, there's also a substantial amount of federal regulation generally, including social spending, health care, and even federal criminal law. Now, there are two big theories why people think voting is important, uh, even though those two theories overlap, and we could probably find a third or fourth theory if we tried. Uh, but these two theories, I think, can at least get us uh, started. The first theory is that uh, voting aims to decentralize policies and authority. So maybe you let voters decide things because they're intrinsically smart and they know what's best for themselves and for the government. So when you include more perspectives, that means achieving better governmental results. The second theory is political management. You let voters choose leadership on election day, and maybe they won't rebel or protest so much about policy decisions they don't like afterward. In this way, voting allows the indirectly allows the government to work better as a unit with more manageable levels of dissent and strife kind of down the road. So that's a little bit of theory 
uh, we can move on if you want to think about history and the facts. Uh, in the beginning, uh, British colonies actually had quite a lot of voting, uh, maybe more than anywhere in the world. Voting happened largely in public, and some folks uh, voted orally in groups, a little like maybe you think of the modern caucuses, political caucuses in Iowa and Nevada. Sometimes colonial governments even published lists of who voted one way or another. Now, you can all see that these early systems had some pros and cons. For example, on the downside, written secret ballots like we have today can make voter literacy a deal breaker. If you can't vote, you can't read. Uh, and in the middle of the colonial era, literacy rates changed over times for different groups of people. So-called voice voting helped to address that problem. And so did these uh, maybe more peculiar voting methods of some early colonial Pennsylvanians. Uh, they used different colored beams for different candidates and dropped one and the other. But either way, uh, public voting meant greater access. On the other hand, voting out in public also creates opportunities for individuals to socially pressure, support, or shame one another. So, you know, some of your neighbors today, you might want to know how they vote, but other neighbors, maybe you'd rather not know, and maybe vice versa. With some neighbors, you want they would know how you might have voted. Uh, that also could create uh, problems uh, kind of in the neighborhood. In British North America, 75% of adult white males were eligible to vote in colonial America. Now the British homeland had nothing like that. Back in England, maybe only one out of 10 adult males were allowed to vote. Still, colonial voters were only 10 to 20% of the population because voting rules systematically excluded many different groups of people. This exclusion was not by accident, and the U.S. Revolution actually didn't change that much. Uh, for example, uh, one argument that was used to exclude children and women was that men were supposed to vote for their family's best interest. Another idea for limited voting rights was that men without property didn't have enough stake in political decisions, they uh, maybe should be, uh, they, their private power could, uh, th I'm sorry, third idea is that men without property might be influenced or controlled by their landlords or employers. So the idea is that private power can squash the independence of voters who need money. If I need money, I'll be controlled by my landlord or my employer. Uh, the idea was maybe you'll just leave those unproperty folks out from the get go. There were also religious barriers against Catholics. Jews, Quakers, and others. For example, the government sometimes required prospective voters to swear that they were legally eligible to vote by pledging their Christian soul and affirming the divinity of Jesus. From the start, voting was a functional way to allocate power, and it was also a symbolic way to declare who was in and who was out of the governmental community. As it turns out, African Americans who were not enslaved could vote at various times in 18th century America, including Connecticut, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Now, many of those voting rights for freed African Americans would be explicitly repealed over time. So let's move on to talk about the Constitution. The original Constitution said almost nothing about voting rights. For example, when the Constitution required elections for the House of Representatives, it explicitly made federal voter eligibility identical to state voting standards. And under modern law, the Senate works exactly the same. To pick an example, wherever the laws of any state exclude convicted felons from state elections, that state law excluding convicted felons 
is constitutionally sufficient to exclude convicted felons from federal elections as well. The Civil War did some things for voting rights, but maybe not as much as some people think. For example, the 15th Amendment did not technically grant anyone the right to vote. The 15th Amendment only forbade explicit forms of racial discrimination. Southern states responded to the 15th Amendment by developing racist voting procedures 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, and so on. They strategically combined literacy tests, poll taxes, and other legal requirements alongside illegal and dramatic forms of intimidation and violence to stop black men from voting. Some Northern states tried similar tactics, but the sheer magnitude of white power in the South was unmatched. One well-known example is Loundus County, Alabama. In Loundus County, as late as the 1960s, the population was 80% black, but not a single African-American voter was registered, not one voter in Loundus County. Also, here's just a tiny list of some of the folks who were murdered in the struggle. Maceo Snipes, Vernon Dahmer, Harriet and Henry Moore, George Lee, Herbert Lee, Warless Jackson, Jonathan Myers, Reverend Reeb, Jimmy Jackson, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner, Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Carol Robertson, and Carol Denise McNair. There aren't nearly enough steel columns in Montgomery's Memorial for Peace and Justice to commemorate the full violence that happened as every violent act created more waves of social intimidation and some intermingled fraction of that violent intimidation was about voting rights. Let's come back to race in a minute, but first a few things about women's voting rights. The 1840s witnessed important cooperation among some anti-slavery activists and advocates for women's suffrage. However, during Reconstruction after the Civil War, the dominant national politics failed to emphasize voting rights for women. And one clause of the new 14th Amendment explicitly mentioned for the first time the exclusive constitutional importance of male voters, thus prompting 50 years of further conflict over female voters. Shifting backward in time again, New Jersey's earliest state governments briefly allowed some women, black, white, and otherwise, to vote from 1790 to 1807. But the first women voters after the Civil War were white people in Wyoming territory. The particular politics of that historical episode are hard to figure out even today, but Wyoming's decision to allow women voters was quickly followed by other federal territories, Utah, Montana, and Washington, as well as the state of Colorado in 1893. The 19th Amendment was finally ratified in 1920. That decision was influenced by World War I. It was influenced by a global women's movement. It was influenced by President Wilson's domestic political goals, among other factors. The suffrage movement of women's voting rights was a huge success with respect to voting. There wasn't any resistance comparable to Loundis County or the mid 20th century South. The arguments against women voters were somewhat different than the arguments made against black voters just as the overlapping context in general of racism and sexism. Those two concepts are themselves similar and different one from the other. 
just to emphasize some similarities about race and sex, <clears throat> there were some concerns that including women voters could change substantive governmental policies. Theories about women versus masculine values, feminine versus masculine experiences, feminine versus masculine capacities, and feminine versus masculine human nature. These were all predicted to show up in ballot box results, ultimately leading to some form of socialism. But of course, the arguments ran even deeper, suggesting that to alter women's political status would defeminize them and corrupt them, as with this picture of women in a bar drinking, smoking, and chewing tobacco, just like men. There was an image of women as above politics, or at least separate from it, as with this children's appeal for mom to please stay out of politics. There was also a problem that some advocates of women's suffrage, like Victoria Woodhull, were associated with free love, which contrasted with the broader image at that time of women as opposing alcohol and generally supporting good morals. That wasn't the only problem, however. To allow women's voting rights in the public sphere was also supposed to risk feminizing men at home. As with this father, who is wearing pink, he's at home with the baby as his wife strolls away mischievously with a cane, cigar, top hat, and pants. Women and their pro-suffragist allies achieved extraordinary success in voting, not just theoretically, but also in practice. And as many of you may know, women voters in most national elections today outnumber men by seven to 10 million votes in each election. Now that statistic, seven to 10 million, obviously intersects with other demographic characteristics, including race, wealth, and age. But for now, I'd just like to stress the complicated relationships between public voting rights and other aspects of human life. Women suffragists certainly did not suddenly escape from vicious sexism and misogyny 100 years ago when they were legally able to vote. Nor have women today escaped modern versions of those same phenomena, including in the workplace, at home, sexual harassment, and violence. Voting rights help to change the political imagery and the substantive status of women in the United States. At the same time, almost in reverse, if you think of it that way, the changing political roles and the demands of women themselves, that's what helped produce the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And just to say one more thing that should be obvious, uh, we are all of us living in different ways in different contexts with the transformative results that produced women's voting rights and that resulted from women's voting rights. Turning back to race, the most important legal instrument regulating voting rights was never the constitution itself. It was the voting rights of 1965. This statute embodied the tireless work and personal risks of countless organizers and citizens throughout the country. It was pushed forward, the Voting Rights Act was, it was pushed forward in late stages by the famous march, Martin Luther King from Selma to Montgomery. The Voting Rights Act was the most successful civil rights statute in US history, and it forever altered legal expectations about what could qualify as an acceptable voting system in this country. This next section, you'll have to stop me if the following gets too technical, but I would like to discuss, if I could, three sections of the Voting Rights Act. That discussion of the act can help explain what the Supreme Court of the United States has done to voting rights recently and what the Supreme Court might conceivably do in the future. I wanna have this part of the discussion, not because the Supreme Court is the most important actor in this field or in the world. I'll come back to that issue later. Nonetheless, I am a law professor who specializes in federal courts. 
so talking about this stuff is kind of an occupational hazard. Uh, also, I think it's true that describing the Supreme Court's recent actions will help emphasize what does need to happen next. We'll see how it goes. The first section I want to talk about is Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, that section has been amended over the years. But Section 2 crucially limits a government's ability to exclude non-white voters through registration requirements like a literacy test or a civics test. I don't know whether anyone has seen the old movie, uh, Selma. Uh, but in that movie, Oprah Winfrey has a terrific scene about this as she confronts a particularly racist voting registrar who continues to ask her questions until she fails. Section two is also important, not just for literacy tests and civic tests, it's also important for redistricting cases where a government has allegedly, I'm sorry, that's an image of the, uh, of the literacy test. Uh, if you look at it carefully, it may be hard to read. Uh, you had 30 questions you had to answer in 10 minutes and even one wrong answer would fail. I've been reading things uh, through my life for quite, quite a long time. And what I can say is that under the pressure of uh, ex executing this test, uh, I think some of the ambiguous questions and vague questions would make almost anyone uh, fail at least more than they would think. Put a different way, uh, when I looked at this test and tried to take it myself, I learned maybe I wasn't as literate as I thought. And of course, what was at stake in failing the literacy test was being disqualified from voting altogether. Anyway, as I was saying, a section two is also important for redistricting cases. And redistricting cases are where a government has allegedly drawn geographic voting lines in order to concentrate or dilute racial groups, for example, in order to manipulate electoral outcomes. Depending on the circumstances, for example, one idea might be to put all of the black folks in one voting district so they can win only one or two seats. And that's what's alleged to have happened in North Carolina before 2017. You can see here that the black voters have been concentrated in this one district, and then this really tiny uh, sort of um, uh, district around a highway uh, that's 50.7% uh, that's black. The goal there is to put all of the black voters in one place uh, so that they cannot win as many seats as they would ordinarily. Another idea, equal and opposite in different circumstances, is that perhaps you might spread racial minorities across to a lot of different districts. And if you spread them across a lot of different districts, maybe they won't be a majority or even a decisive voting block in even one district. Anyway, in modern times, the Supreme Court's conservative supermajority, which makes it the most conservative Supreme Court that any living person has seen, the Supreme Court's conservative supermajority has done a few things to limit Section 2. In 2021, they upheld an Arizona state law that criminalized ballot collection and another Arizona law that refused to count otherwise proper ballots if those properly filled out ballots happened to be cast in the wrong precinct, somebody went to the wrong office or such. Even though those two laws, criminalizing ballot collection, refusing to count proper ballots in the wrong precinct, even though those Arizona statutes severely disadvantaged Native voters, Latina voters, and Black Arizonans, the Supreme Court held that those statutes were not discriminatory enough they were not legally problematic enough to violate Section 2 and to be banned by the Voting Rights Act. In that same case about these Arizona statutes, Justice Gorsuch, Neil Gorsuch, wrote a very strange concurring opinion. Now, ever since 1965, when the Voting Rights Act was first passed, there have been two ways to enforce Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. The Department of Justice can file a lawsuit on behalf of the federal government. Upside, the Department of Justice has limited financial resources, but extremely talented lawyers. They can bring only a few cases. 
The second way to enforce uh, Section 2 is individuals can sue. And if individuals can sue, private entities can sue, that creates vastly larger opportunities for the legal enforcement of voting rights. You can imagine litigation by national public interest groups, uh, by political parties, by unions, anybody else who might be affected. The vast majority of Section 2 cases trying to ban racially discriminatory voting practice, the vast majority were filed by private entities, not by the Department of Justice directly. Anyway, Justice Gorsuch wrote in this recent case that even though there were 60 years, 60 years of precedent with many thousands of lawsuits brought by private individuals and private entities, Justice Gorsuch wrote that maybe only the Department of Justice should legally be able to sue under Section 2 and not anybody else. Now, we'll all have to see what happens on that issue. My own guess, for whatever it's not worth, is that Gorsuch probably wasn't alone in having that point of view. Uh, but hopefully he doesn't have a majority on the Supreme Court. At least he doesn't have that majority yet. So that's all Section 2 talk for the moment. But equally important is uh, Section 5 of the Act. Uh, Section 5 is a little more technical, but it basically puts certain states and counties on what I'll call tonight, if you'll let me, it puts those states and counties on a voting rights hot seat, sort of on, on notice, but they're on a voting rights hot seat. And short of it is, if some places have a historically bad or suspicious voting record, some state or some county, that state and county that is not allowed to change anything about their local voting rules at all, unless they can affirmatively prove to the Department of Justice that the rule change they want to make will not limit voting rates, uh, rights based on race. Uh, this whole Section 5 process and system it's called the pre-clearance system. It's called that because a state or a locality has to get pre-clearance if it wants to change its voting laws, uh, the pre-clearance system under Section 5. So in simplest terms, Section 2 that we were talking about a minute ago, Section 2 helps to eliminate discriminatory voting rules. But Section 5 prevents states from developing new discriminatory voting rules of version 2.0, version 3.0, et cetera. Uh, nothing has been more legally important for fair voting in this country than section five, literally nothing. So the third section I wanna talk about, uh, it's again, a little complicated, but the third section of the Voting Rights Act I wanna talk about is section four. And section four asks a really crucial question. How do states and localities get on the hot seat? Uh, which states have to pre-clear or had to pre-clear every change in their voting procedures? And the short answer is that states that behaved badly in the 1960s and 70s, uh, they imposed a test and they had less than 50% registration of their population or they had less than 50% of voting in their population. But maybe it's important to say, uh, states can also get added to or subtracted from the hot list based on their own recent voting compliance or their recent violations. Now, I don't know, this statutory formula, maybe it seems weird uh, if you haven't encountered it before, but this formula of uh, bad behavior in the 60s and 70s with the on and off uh, so-called bail-in or bail-out provisions, that same formula was repeatedly reenacted by Congress. They did it in 1965, they did it in 1970, they did it in 1985, and they did it in 2006. The Voting Rights Act formula, Section 4, was signed into law by President Johnson back in 60, but also by President Nixon, by President Reagan, and by President George W. Bush. And if you follow this, uh, some of you are already asking, why did all those folks 
decide to use such a backward looking formula all those different times they passed the Voting Rights Act? Why did they keep using this backward looking formula, relying on the 60s and 70s, even when they wrote up the statute in 2006? Now, the explanation is very straightforward. The reason they kept reusing that formula is just very simple politics. The Voting Rights Act, on the one hand, was so popular and so fundamental for American identity that uh, both parties had to support it. But on the other hand, the details of how to do that thing, the Voting Rights Act, were so controversial that legislators could not agree to redesign any kind of new formula for the voting rights hot seat under Section 4 or Section 5. You know, one way to think about it is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, but on the other hand, national politicians actually couldn't fix it if they tried. On the contrary, each time, decade after decade, Congress stuck with the same basic equation, historically rooted in bad behavior from the 60s and 70s with these bail-in, bail-out provisions to update the list over time. Okay, fine. As the case came to the Supreme Court, this case challenging the Voting Rights Act, uh, you're wondering who was on the hot seat. So here's the list of states that required DOJ preclearance in 2013. Uh, you know, I, th I think uh, some of those states, as you can see, were added from 1965, uh, including my home state of South Carolina, uh, some other states that might not be very surprising to you when you think about the Deep South and the things I've been talking about. Um, there are some other states that were added in 1975 um, based on other behavior. But anyway, this is the list, one way or the other. This is the list of states that were as a whole covered. There's a longer list I didn't copy for you about other parts of states and counties that required DOJ preclearance in 2013. Now I'm going to show you the list of states that require DOJ preclearance after 2013, the list of states that require DOJ preclearance today. And it's kind of a trick because there aren't any at all, none. And the reason is because uh, Shelby County, Atlanta, Shelby County, Atlanta, Shelby County is the name of the case. Shelby County, Atlanta, Alabama, Shelby County, Alabama is only 50 or 60 miles north of Selma, north of Montgomery. Shelby County, Alabama sued, attacking the Voting Rights Act's preclearance system, and they won. This decision, the Shelby County case, and I can talk about it as much as you want to hear about it, but this decision by the Supreme Court, here's my hot take. The Shelby County case is the worst Supreme Court decision of my lifetime. That's what I believe. Before the Shelby County case, the Supreme Court had continuously and repeatedly upheld Section 4 as constitutionally valid. Most recently, it had done so in 1999. The vote in 1999, which upheld the Voting Rights Act formula, that vote was 8 to 1. In 2013, 14 years later, Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion that scrapped the entire system, the entire formula, and that vote was five to four. I think it's a disgraceful decision, uh, if I could just say that much. That's the least I can say about it. There are quite a lot of other constitutional issues that we could discuss. Um, for example, my own uh, research at the moment is focused on three categories of space, not focused on people like race or sex but categories of space that are in different ways excluded from federal voting, categories of geography. So one of those is the District of Columbia. The District of Columbia is explicitly provided for in the Constitution. Uh, the District of Columbia has been a central political struggle for the United States uh, at least uh, for 150 years. Um, the current demographics of the um, District of Columbia. There's a very, as you can see from this chart, a very large uh, African-American population. And although DC residents, uh, thanks to the 23rd Amendment, are allowed to cast electoral votes in a presidential election, 
uh, they can't vote uh, for anybody to represent them in Congress. And anyone who follows the news, I mean, maybe not everybody follows DC news, uh, but the local government there, every law that they pass, Congress can reject that law. And actually, uh, just, just recently, the last month or so, uh, actually, they did reject, uh, the Congress did reject uh, laws that had been passed by the local DC government. The local DC government is entirely under the supervision and the thumb of Congress, Congress that they cannot vote in any way to influence or affect. Uh, this is why their license plates, depending on the administration on and off, their license plates say taxation without representation. Uh, because whatever it is that Congress does, they have no more votes in Congress than the British colonists had in Parliament when they had to send their colonial laws over to the homeland in England to get approved or disapproved. D.C. residents see the absence of voting rights as a fundamental commentary on their importance in federal government, their membership in America. Uh, and this is sort of one of the crucial issues that I think uh, people talk about today uh, that I'm researching a little bit. A second issue, uh, sometimes linked, most often not thought about quite the same way, uh, are uh, American territories. I'll talk a little more about that category, but Puerto Rico is the most important one. There are a number of different territories that are held by the United States around the world, but 95% of the people, I believe it's about that, uh, live in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico, uh, similarly, they don't even have the electoral votes in the in presidential race. Of course, they do not. Uh, but the way the Constitution is set up, the only people who can vote uh, in Congress, uh, can vote for representatives in Congress or senators, uh, with the exception of the 23rd Amendment, the only people who can vote for presidential electors are people who live in states. And the folks in Puerto Rico do not. So there again, uh, and there is a racial element uh, to Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican history, which again, we can discuss as much as anybody wants to. Um, but there's again, a racial element and this sort of idea that uh, Puerto Ricans, people who live in Puerto Rico uh, are outside and inside uh, the United States. They're inside in the, in the sense of being regulated by the federal government, uh, managed by the federal government, their local government is under the thumb of the federal government, uh, but they do not have any representation in that federal government. They are ruled by an empire uh, that they do not experience as a republic. They're not represented in that republic. And then a third category, which almost nobody thinks of alongside uh, DC and Puerto Rico uh, is a category of native land uh, where voters are necessarily mixed and diluted with non-native voters of various states. And the problem in this sense is actually very old. Hmm, let's see, that's not exactly the slide that I wanted, I don't believe. Let's see if this comes up right. Problem is very old, but maybe it also feels uh, pretty new. Uh, so slightly farther afield, ah, technology is killing me at the moment. Um, the problem of territories in DC and native voters, in a certain sense, it might feel pretty new, it might feel pretty old. Let me say something about why it might feel old. Uh, the United States from the very beginning uh, had an idea about uh, states and places that weren't states. So the Northwest Territory is set up even before the Constitution. And if you went from uh, Pennsylvania to uh, Ohio, what you think of as Ohio, you went from a place where you were voting to a place that you weren't, a place that you could vote in federal elections to a place you could not. And so I think that's very important to know. Uh, the District of Columbia has been around uh, old as the hills. Uh, Puerto Rico, territories that have not become states, that problem is a little bit new, uh, new in the sense of 1898, uh, not too new. Um, and then I think the idea that there would be permanently managed imperial lands where American citizens could not vote I think is uh, difficult, would have been a difficult one to reconcile with some of the ideas of 1776 or when that Declaration of Independence or 1787 with the Constitution. That's one way to think about it. And of course, the exclusion of native peoples and native land 
inside and outside of the United States, uh, inside the United States for purposes of being regulated by the United States, but outside the United States uh, for other purposes is also a very old problem. What's changed is that all of this voting progress that I've been trying to talk about tonight in the United States and around the world has changed the ideas about who should be represented in government and who should be governing human beings. And it is, no, it is now much more controversial than it was before to think about colonialist empires ruled uh, from above. Uh, I think that's a, a, a much more controversial idea than it is today. Anyway, uh, you know, one of the articles that I've written about this is called a United Slash States as a charting of how states emerged. Another article not yet published is called Beyond States. It was talking about this fundamental problem of territories as lands outside of statehood and therefore talking about tonight, therefore people who are outside voting for Congress uh, or for the presidency. Uh, one other category of uh, uh, Supreme Court cases or constitutional law that one might talk about uh, concerns the Supreme Court's continued march against campaign finance re regulation, including the well-known case uh, Citizens United. Uh, one idea people might have is how can people vote? How can you have a fair election if individuals are bulldozed uh, by money, this idea that money is speech and gets uh, a very uh, broad First Amendment protection. That is an idea that's, uh, that's pretty old now at this point. Citizens United was not the first case to try to talk about the relationship between money and speech. Uh, and of course, it's true that private power, non-governmental power, money power has played a fundamental role in American government and American voting and what we have called American democracy for a really, really long time. Uh, nevertheless, in a world of large voting patterns and machines and ground games and the cost going higher and higher, uh, I think that there are some folks, maybe included on this call, who experience the constitutional protection of money as speech and therefore the unraveling of federal statutes that control or try to control campaign finance, at least providing disclosure, if not actual limits on the amounts that can be send, spent. I think there are people who perceive a connection between those Citizens United cases uh, and voting rights, and of course also issues around social media and the internet. Uh, I want to conclude, and I appreciate you folks' patience about it, but I want to conclude talking about solutions and for better or for worse, my own proposals are not very sophisticated. They're just all really hard. Uh, for instance, uh, every step to make uh, voting easier, uh, I think I would have to count as a positive step. One of the things that's not always recognized about the 2020 election uh, is that, you know, of course, more voters turned out. So I think when you think about mail-in ballots or you think about public collection sites like we had in Philadelphia, I think these all have to be crucial differences and there are differences that affect different populations in different ways. They, those sorts of uh, race neutral, class neutral uh, policies, uh, they actually have a disparate impact. I think uh, they can have a disparate impact allowing uh, voters of color and uh, allowing native voters uh, and allowing uh, poorer voters to have more say, have more chance and having a say. I think all those things are, are very, very important, can be a, a really important countermeasure uh, to some of the other uh, restrictive things that I think are going on. As a naive person, I had believed that once people had mail-in ballots, uh, that would be in for sure. And uh, everyone would love them because, of course, Republicans used to like them and maybe Democrats would like them. Uh, but uh, but uh, that, that, of course, is not how things turned out. It appears that uh, maybe you can hear the uh, the the, uh, the uh, ambulances that are going on 13th Street. Anyway, uh, voting uh, just more city living. Uh, uh, voter education is also important if that's something to say. Uh, and of course, these things are still, nevertheless, whatever upsides one would see in modern voting practices, um, it affects different people in different ways. Now, it is intrinsically hard for candidates to reach populations that don't vote 
and to focus on populations that don't vote when the results of an election depend on populations that do vote. You know, there's no simple line of progress on how things happen. And indeed, the progress that has happened over the history of the country has not been earned on the cheap. And I suggest that everyone on the Zoom call probably has ideas that are at least as good and probably better than mine. Um, but if I could just end with sort of one uh, message, I think it's true that many folks in America uh, from start to finish, they have not gotten the voting rights they deserved uh, at most and only sometimes they've gotten voting rights that they fought for. And I think anyone who wants better democracy, uh, I sort of referenced this earlier, I think there is no hope for a more supportive Supreme Court, more supportive legal remedies. Uh, I think that uh, the task ahead very often is at least at the state level instead of the federal level, because that's where things like the disfranchisement of felons or the process for mail-in ballots uh, or the collection, these laws are all passed at the state level. They will not be supervised by the federal government of the Voting Rights Act the way they have been. And so I think people who want a better democracy and want more inclusive voter, uh, voting uh, procedures I think any of us have to have to basically take our shoulders and uh, and really put it to the work. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for having me. For sure, I'm told that uh, we can have uh, uh, questions in the chat if people have those kinds of things. Uh, but basically, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you about something I care about quite a lot. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. Well, I have a technical question that I, I I often get in the department when I'm answering legal questions for patrons. Uh, when a Supreme Court um, issues a ruling or an opinion, um, technically, how long does it take before it can get referenced in um, like a pocket part in like a USCA or or mm -hmm. other you know, type of printed material for for access? Yeah. And how do you track that? Sure. Effectively? The resources for finding out, I think there's a couple, maybe I'll try a couple answers. There's one that's like resources, like how do you figure out what's going on in the Supreme Court? And um, there are two things that I would recommend to folks. Uh, one thing is every time that there's ever like a news story about an opinion or something like this, you're like, ah, the Supreme Court decided blah, blah, blah. Uh, not always do they have the link to the opinion, but if you can find out the name of that opinion, the Supreme Court has its own website, so supremecourt.gov, and there you can find the opinion kind of right away and read the things and the opinions whenever you want. So that's for finding opinions, just finding opinions, like how do you find out what the Supreme Court actually said or did on any particular day? In my experience, the links are not always as obvious as you think, and so uh, that's a place to look. For things that are coming up or you want to learn more about it or you want some good source of commentaries, there's the thing called SCOTUS blog. That's what it's called. And SCOTUS blog actually has all the briefs. If people are really have a lot of reading time, uh, they have often sort of very uh, short and concise and accurate commentaries, uh, sort of descriptions of cases that might be coming up. This year, people might know there's an awful lot of decisions that are waiting around to be decided. The Supreme Court has been very, very slow. And so I had a, a student today asked about how can I find out what's coming and SCOTUS blog is my best answer. Another question I've, I understood you to be asking is like when a Supreme Court decision happens and we read about it on the website or whatever else, how quickly does that come into effect? A Supreme Court decision will frequently, most often take effect immediately. Uh, so to pick an example, you know, the district courts this week are fighting about whether or not uh, various me medical abortion drugs should or shouldn't be available in the United States. And there's a fight between two different district courts and those things will make their way up the courts of appeals and the government or somebody files for a stay. Don't do that right away. You've decided that thing, but wait. Uh, but when the Supreme Court decides something, there's no stay. It, it just happens right away. Almost always like that minute, it becomes effective across the country. Unlike these other decisions from lower courts, you might hear along the way, Supreme Court. That's why I say when you read on the Supreme Court website, it's the law already. That's already happening that day. Um, and then the, they're the only exception to that. Very good. a big exception for people who are uh, Supreme Court nerds. I'm uh, sorry, myself. Uh, uh, is uh, Brown v. Board of Education, there are sometimes decisions that require such transformative 
remedies that, for example, Brown v. Board of Education in 1954 declared that segregated schools were unconstitutional, but it didn't mix together students that next day. They said the next, they decided another case with all deliberate speed. And so there are very rarely Supreme Court opinions that might transform broad social structures or governmental institutions that would take a while to take effect, to become real, to be experienced. But for example, the day that the Dobbs decision eliminated federal constitutional abortion rights, uh, that day, uh, those rights were no longer effective. And similarly, that, that same term, when they created uh, and recognized new gun rights, those gun rights became effective that day. And so people could use those rights and invoke those rights that day in their own criminal proceedings or in some other legal context. So it's a little weird, uh, but I think these resources in terms of finding out what the Supreme Court's doing, I just don't think anyone could do better than actually just checking out the opinions on the website um, uh, or a SCOTUS blog. Uh, I think it's a very good resource, a very valuable resource to get a lot of sort of secondary materials and quick quick summaries um, uh, without, if you if you don't like going through social or through uh, you know, sort of your favorite podcasts, Strict Scrutiny is a great podcast. Anyway, there are a lot of great podcasts out there too. I know you touched on briefly uh, at the beginning of your lecture, uh, discussions about uh, voting rights history, women's suffrage, and and that. I have a strong pamphlet collection as part of uh, my government publication holdings that go into pro and anti um, suffrage movements. Uh, part of the man suffrage uh, association. Um, a lot of it is Pennsylvania focused, but we do have material that covers various states. Um, it's part of a pamphlet collection, um, but it's interesting. A lot of the material actually includes uh, pamphlets that were produced by women who were not in favor of uh, voting rights. Um, some of it, you know, they, they, they kind of like their rule in the home, and then they were also afraid of uh, repercussions in terms of uh, protections for themselves as part of their arguments. And a lot of those pamphlets go into um, those discussions. And I, I, I personally find it interesting when I'm presenting that, that information to the patrons that I work with, it's um, something that they never even considered as part of that argument. I think that's such an important point, and those materials sound really fascinating. In doing some of the research preparing for tonight, uh, of course, I learned some things myself about the suffrage movement, which are very in line with uh, sort of the details you were talking about. And just you know, to sort of say in a more general way, a lot of folks today, you could read a history book about suffrage, uh, women's suffrage, and basically the anti-suffragists, you would think that maybe they were all men, and you would think that maybe they were just all stupid. And they didn't feel that way at the time, and they certainly weren't all men. In fact, one of the main women's arguments against women's suffrage was they said, uh, you know, which of course your materials I think would support, they said, you know, we'll support women's suffrage when a majority of women support it, and the majority of women do not support it, was the anti-suffragist uh, claim. And I think what's wrapped up in that, but again, you would know more with those particular materials, but I think what's wrapped up in that is women's suffrage linking with ideas about femininity in the society and in the home and what people felt they might be giving up by moving women into a different public sphere from which they had been excluded for an awfully long time. And one other thing that I can mention, which I think makes it, so, of course, as a legal history person, makes it so important to think about uh, these sorts of issues uh, sort of regularly is, you know, that's an issue, what I just described, where I think that the, the women's suffrage movement is really misunderstood, um, really misunderstood to think that, you know, somehow it was women women versus men. But of course, men were the ones who voted for the 19th Amendment. Women were the, you know, women were the ones. And so I think it makes everything, it doesn't make everything you know, simple, but it makes everything very complex to think about what it was that uh, men were doing as allies uh, in line with a long women's rights movement, you know, decades, if not a century of women's rights movement, what did it mean for those men to play a role in connection with women who were working for that thing? And on the other hand, what did it mean for a large number of women to oppose it? One quote from the pro-suffragists that I came across was, well, we didn't wait for women's education until all women wanted to be educated. Now, that was a very interesting idea to think about how it is that women could oppose the rights of other women, even if not themselves. 
uh, to be represented in the work. It just takes it takes work to understand what those people thought and what they were working on. And I think that uh, without those kinds of materials that you have in your collection, you know, I just don't even know how people are supposed to figure it out. You know, it's just it, it, because it, we're not in that world. It's so it feels so obvious to most of us today. Uh, it's very hard to understand what that fight was about, but it was mm -hmm. a big fight. Yeah. It's very interesting. If you're interested, I do have a display uh, in the department. So if anyone is attending this program right. is interested, yeah, come to the Social Science and History Department and look at our display case. Super, that's super, really great. So since I don't see any questions in the chat, uh, I suppose we can end uh, the program on this note. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for attending this program and thank you, uh, Craig, for being here. Um, it's a pleasure hosting and you know, having you here. Uh, and thank you for everyone for attending. Have a great evening. Enjoy your night. Thanks for coming. Bye bye.